gentlemen, here are my uh, disclosures. And I would like first to show you data why vitamin K antagonists have limitations. I think you know this all and you can read it uh, by yourself. So this is why new oral anticoagulants have been developed and finally also tested uh, in huge phase three trials. And I would like to start now with a, a first question. So because you are already experienced uh, with the new oral anticoagulants, when prescribing anticoagulation therapy, what is your point of preference? Preferable one of the new oral anticoagulants, and if not possible, warfarin, or vice versa, preferable warfarin, and if not possible, one of the new oral anticoagulants, or only new oral anticoagulants. So please vote. Can we see the results, please? So I think that's a, a, a quite, quite interesting outcome. More than 50% say preferably neural anticoagulants. Eventually, they're not available in all countries, or eventually, there is some problems with prescription of neural anticoagulants in the first line of anticoagulation therapy in non-valvular atrial fibrillation. But there's a clear trend in favor of using the new oral anticoagulants over warfarin, if this is possible. So uh, I think this very well uh, goes conform with um, the um, indications uh, to use new oral, new oral anticoagulants or warfarin in the recent uh, atrial fibrillation guidelines. It clearly shows you that there should be a preference of the new oral anticoagulants over vitamin K antagonists, although both options for anticoagulation therapy are possible. These are data from a, a recent meta-analysis by Ruff and co-workers in The Lancet 2013. You should now not compare the different new oral anticoagulants with respect uh, to what is seen here uh, in, the, in the outcome results, uh, because these are data where the new oral anticoagulants here, the Bigatran 2 times 150 milligram uh, in rocket, a 20 milligram rivaroxaban in Aristotle, uh, two times five uh, uh, milligram of apixaban. And uh, the data for engage here, which I have included or which I included already, is 60 milligrams once daily. So if you, if you look at, at this data, these are comparisons of the new oral anticoagulants versus warfarin. And this is the primary endpoint, stroke or systemic embolic events. And this is eventually the analysis uh, where statisticians will tell us this is the right way to do it, intention to treat. And it shows us that the bigger drug, 2 times 150 milligrams, has a statistical significant benefit over warfarin with respect to this endpoint. Rivaroxaban once daily, a trend for benefit in the intention to treat analysis. We come to this uh, back a bit later. Uh, and in Aris, totally a peaks around 2 times 5 milligram, also a statistical uh, significant benefit. I don't want to discuss uh, edoxaban at the moment because this drug uh, is not available in our countries. Now, what about major bleeding complications? Here, there seems to be a clear advantage of a pixaban, 2 times 5 milligrams, over warfarin, while the higher dosage of the bigatran and here also in the rocket trial, rivaroxaban are only as good as warfarin with respect to severe bleedings. And if you look at pooled data with respect to intracranial hemorrhage, we know that all these substances have a huge advantage with this respect. There's an almost 70% relative risk reduction if you use a new oral anticoagulant versus warfarin with this outcome. On the other hand, with respect to gastrointestinal bleedings, there seems to be an increase, as shown here, for the new oral anticoagulants because they are already active in the gastrointestinal uh, inter intestinal tract and uh, uh, might therefore lead uh, to bleedings. There is only one exception, less gastrointestinal bleeds. It's only a trend with a pixaban, so eventually uh, a quite interesting substance for certain patients. And this is why we treat uh, patients with non valvular atrial fibrillation. We, in first line, want to uh, prevent, uh, uh, prevent ischemic strokes. 
And the only substance that has been shown to do this statistically significant versus warfarin was the bigger run in the higher dosage, while the lower dosage of the bigger run or all the other substances uh, were only as good as warfarin, and they mainly worked via the reduction of hemorrhagic strokes and severe bleeding. So I think this is also an important finding. So if you look at this data, so, and I already told you, you should not compare the different neural anticoagulants uh, among each other. So I come to my next question. So based on the data you have seen, what, what is your choice? How do you determine which new oral anticoagulant to use? Is it always the Bigatran first? Is it Rivaroxaban? Is it Apixaban? But, or does it vary according to the individual patients? So it's your choice now, please vote. And let us see the results, please. And I think we can live very well with this, uh, with point four, where more than 50% of the audience voted for an individual uh, <coughs> a choice of the different substances. So all the others are between 10 and 20% with respect to a first use. And, and this also might be reflected by, by the agents that are available and refunded in the different countries. So why are there eventually differences if you look at new oral anticoagulants versus vitamin K antagonists? And, and why is it not, not fair to compare the drugs uh, among each other? And I give you just uh, several explanations for that. So first, the baseline characteristics in these trials were completely different. And just to give you uh, two options, with respect to the CHAT score, with the risk of the patients, uh, a CHAT score of more than three, I'm sorry for this, the CHAT score of more than three uh, was um, uh, only shown in the rocket trial in more than 80% and in more than 50% in the uh, engaged trial with edoxaban. You can see this also uh, here uh, on, the, on, the, on the down part of the slide. While in the other trials in Rely and Aristotle, there was a mixture of different risk groups. So about one uh, a third of patients had a very low list, uh, risk, a chat score of 0, 1, uh, about one third a risk of 2, and about one third a higher risk between 3 and 6. So, so this is one difference within the trials. Uh, another potential difference comes from uh, the history of prior stroke TIA. So whether you do a primary prevention study or we do more a secondary prevention study. And there is also Rivaroxaban with 55% of patients uh, having had a prior stroke or TIA. So this is another a group of patients with a, a higher risk, and this might also influence the outcome. While in the other studies, uh, it was mainly um, a primary pre prevention. Although we cannot say that, that, that these drugs work better in primary prevention, then in secondary prevention, I think this is a, a point that has to, has to be discussed. And there are also other differences within these studies. What about to the study designs, all this, also the study design and, and how you measure endpoints might be an important feature if you look at the data that have been generated. For example, with a RELY trial, with uh, the Bigatran, so the study was, uh, was, was finished at, um, when, uh, at, at the end, and there was no more collection of bleeding or ischemic events. The same happened with a Pixoban, but with a rocket trial, when the study was finished, about two weeks longer, there was, uh, there was an evaluation of ischemic events and also of bleeding events. And why is this important? Because if we look in rocket, to the phase after uh, the, the study drugs were stopped. Then it needed about two weeks until patients that were primarily on the new oral anticoagulant were fully anticoagulated again by vitamin K antagonist. 
And exactly within these two weeks where there was not an optimal anticoagulation, there were, was an increase of ischemic events. So if you use only the data from the beginning until the end of study medication, and if you exclude the collection of ischemic events in the phase immediately afterwards, you get a quite different result. You could call this some kind of a on-treatment analysis, and you see that all of a sudden there is a statistical benefit uh, even for rivaroxaban versus warfarin. So I think these are just some ideas I would like to share with you. So it's not so easy to say that one drug eventually uh, is really better compared to another drug, and there are no head-to-head -head comparisons existing at the moment. So another question is once or twice dosing these drugs per day. And if you look at the, uh, on the left-hand side, so if you do a once daily dosage, you have a very high peak level and a relatively low trough level. If you do it twice daily, so this is uh, uh, not as, as a high peak, but it's uh, a big higher trough level. And the question is, is dual, uh, 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 is, is twice daily dosing something which has something to do with an increased bleeding rate because of the higher trough level? And eventually, uh, has it something to do with the lower efficacy because of the lower peak level? So it's not clear, and we have different, uh, had different discussions with this respect. For example, a pixaban with a very low bleeding rates is a twice daily uh, <coughs> uh, application. Uh, but one thing that could be important is that you do a twice daily dosing. So if you forget it once, nothing happened. If you get it twice, so you, uh, you are also in a, in a, in a, in a still uh, acceptable uh, range. And if you forget it three times, you are at the same level compared to when you forget the once daily dosing. So also this is something that can be discussed uh, with respect uh, to uh, the choice of the drug. We have also clinical data over the past years since uh, these uh, substances have been introduced. And the best clinical data with respect to long-term use of neural anticoagulants comes from the agent that has been introduced uh, <coughs> very early, which is the Vigatran. And uh, I just give you two options. So this is the start of treatment after the study has stopped. And you can see with respect to stroke and systemic embolism, the Vigatran 150 milligram was somewhat better over time compared to the Vigatran 2 times 110 milligram. It's exactly what has been shown within the first two years in the RELY trial. And if you go for bleeding complications, it's vice versa. As expected, you have more bleeding complications over time with 150 milligram twice daily. So uh, this uh, just uh, tells us that the data that have been generated within the first two years uh, of the trial uh, are very similar for the two different uh, 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 doses of the bigger run on the long-term run. And meanwhile, the data exist up to seven years. So I think this is very important to know that these drugs can be used uh, <coughs> over a longer time. Unfortunately, warfarin has not been tested in the extension of the RELY trial. What about cardioversion? We have data from almost all substances, but cardioversion uh, or a planned cardioversion <coughs> was an ex well, it was an exclusion point in these trials. Nevertheless, uh, patients needed cardioversion due to the clinical situation. And as can be shown from the uh, post hoc analysis of the RELY trial, there was no difference between the two different abigatran doses and warfarin with respect uh, to stroke systemic embolism in patients who underwent uh, electric cardioversion. And even there seemed to be a small trend in favor of the bigger run with a higher dosage. We have similar comparable data, meanwhile also seen for rivaroxaban, and one of the advantages of rivaroxaban is that, that, that they now started a prospective randomized trial with respect uh, to uh, cardioversion. Very important data that will be available only uh, in one or two years from now. Another thing we learned over the, over the last years is uh, <clears throat> what we should do in patients who bleed. And the first uh, thing we have to think about is how we are able to avoid bleeding. And we have already heard about the Hasblet score or other bleeding risk scores. We could use them. It's important to 
to, to have a relatively short choice of duration of antithrombotic therapy, especially if you combine different antithrombotic drugs. So this is important for dual or even triple therapy. And also the perisurgical strategies have to be clear. I come to this a bit later. So this is very important. Uh, <coughs> and we have learned a lot um, <coughs> with respect to these points over the past years, uh, just uh, with the clinical, with the use of these drugs in clinical routine. At the moment, there is no antidote available. There is an antidote for uh, the bigger trial now going in a phase uh, three trial, which is a humanized uh, <coughs> um, anti-mouse antibody. But the question is, do we will need an, antibot, which, uh, an antidote which is working immediately? And so we come also uh, <coughs> to a short discussion about how to treat severe bleeding here. In and these are the data, again, coming from the update of the atrial fibrillation uh, guidelines that uh, tell you that if you have a minor bleeding, you just stop one drug, uh, discontinue treatment, and then uh, after bleeding has stopped, you continue again with moderate to severe bleeding. It's mainly symptomatic, supportive treatment, like mechanical compression, if necessary, fluid replacement, blood transfusion. And in very severe bleeding, well, you have to consider the use of protrombin uh, co uh, complex concentrates, um, uh, coagulation factors, and also, for example, for the bigger time, hemodialysis would be an option. So we have learned that all these measurements <coughs> are possible, and they might help. And uh, this comes again from trials with the bigger time, the drug that was first um, uh, on the market. And we have, uh, I have seen similar data now also for rivaroxaban. And what can you see here is the 30-day mortality after severe bleeding complications that had to be treated by physicians without having an antidote available. And what happened was that if you use uh, the bigger drug, you have even a lower 30-day mortality, uh, although no antidote is available compared to the mortality after warfarin treatment. So it's something completely uh, controversial uh, in the discussions we, we, we have with anesthesiologists. And surgeons, for example, they, they believe that it's easier to counteract warfarin. And these data have also been shown, meanwhile, for rivaroxaban. Perisurgical strategies, we have learned a lot here. And this is just uh, <coughs> a recommendation how it could be done on a, on a, on a, on a basic uh, <coughs> Um, uh, recommendation that you use, for example, uh, first you have to do cre the creatinine clearance, which is most important for the bigatran treated patients because 80% uh, of the bigatran is cleared via the kidneys, but also about 30 to 40% uh, is cleared with the other uh, uh, new oral anticoagulants. So creatinine clearance is important. And if you have a standard risk or a high risk, then there are different recommendations in the standard risk. You would hold the drug for two to three half-lives, which is about 10 to 12 hours for all these drugs, or up, up to five drug half-lives in a high bleeding risk. More important than because we know when we have to stop the drug is when to restart the drug again. And this depends on the individual situation, the post-operative bleeding risk with patients if we have to um, uh, talk here and interact with, uh, with the respective surgeons. And uh, it's not only for rivaroxaban. All these drugs, neural anticoagulants, are active within one and a half or two hours, and we shouldn't use them too early in the full dosage just to prevent post-operative bleeding complications. And we have very nice data with respect to the bigatran, which is which depends on renal function. You can see here on the left-hand side a normal function, um, um, a moderately reduced uh, function, and in uh, patients with less than 30 uh, ml per minute, there's a contraindication to use this drug. But renal function has a clear impact on the half-life of this drug, and this, again, would then have an impact uh, when to start the drug before, uh, uh, for example, an elective surgical approach. My last uh, question refers to renal insufficiency. Is it clear which dose of neural anticoagulants and patient eligibility for patients with renal insufficiency uh, <coughs> to you? Yes, it is clear. It would be 0.1. No, there is no clarity 
at the moment what to do. You're unaware of different dosage recommendations, but there are dosage recommendations. I hope you are not completely unaware. And you would prescribe warfarin for those with renal insufficiency. Is this, uh, what, what of the options would you choose, please? Vote here. And can we see the results? So for most of you, it is clear, I'm uh, glad to see this. So within the trials, uh, a patient with an EGFR of less than 30 ml per minute was excluded. So this was a clear contraindication. We know from the factor 10 inhibitors uh, from other uh, trials that we could use them also uh, within a range of 15 to 29 uh, ml per, per minute, which is not the case for the, the bigger trial where there's a clear contraindications, and there is some recommendation, especially for rivaroxaban and apixaban, to use the lower dosage because it is believed that these patients have higher bleeding, that these patients uh, <coughs> with a reduced renal function have an increased bleeding rate. Uh, and the lower dosage would be 15 milligram rivaroxaban once daily, or two times 2.5 milligram apixaban. And also with respect to the bigger tran, uh, physicians tend to use two times one 10 milligram in patients with reduced renal functions. So what is the outcome with respect uh, to a reduced renal function? Quote. So this is mainly between 30 and 50 ml per, per min for these different uh, substances uh, <laughs> that discuss trials. So the bigger tran with respect to stroke or systemic embolism seems to have uh, still um, a huge benefit versus warfarin if you use the higher dosage. There is a clear trend of benefit for all the other drugs and the lower dosage of the bigger drug with respect to patients with reduced renal function. If you look at major bleeding, uh, we see again that apixaban has an advantage with this respect also in patients with severe bleeding. So it's not clear that, that we really have to reduce the dosage, and I come to my last slide. Summary with respect to renal impairment. Renal function, I think, is a key determinant of stroke and bleeding risk. The guidelines recommend warfarin, different guidelines, for an EGFR 15 to 30, but not less than 15 ml per minute, unless there's a prior stroke. So we know that. So if you have a very severely reduced renal function, we might work with a vitamin K antagonist. But as I told you, a pixaban and rivoxaban would also be uh, uh, um, uh, would also have an indication uh, now for an EGFR 15 to 30. New oral anticoagulants versus warfarin produce consistent results for stroke in patients with a moderately reduced renal function, and the recommendation for the reduced dosage of new oral anticoagulants in really impaired patients aims to minimize extracranial bleeding. So I have to show you mainly now data with respect to the uh, clinical efficacy in these patients. And this was my last slide. I would like to thank you uh, for being here and for your interest.